it is lurking. <laughs> the question isn't if it's going to get you, but when. Oh, oh, oh my, oh my, oh my. Hi, y'all. Um, what's going on? <laughs> okay, could you could you stop that? Yeah, it's gonna get you. Please, that that doesn't narrator. That doesn't help. <laughs> okay, please, ma'am, you have to stop. She can't, cause it's gonna get her. No spider attack has ever happened like this. This is ridiculous. Tarantulas are not really dangerous. Hey. Come on, that's kind of mean. No, it's true. Go ahead. Get her. Yeah, get her, like I predicted. Oh, cut, cut, it out. cut it out, narrator guy. Cut it out. That's silly, man. Come on. Come on. That's not we don't need that narrator guy. Okay, so I'm not dangerous. Ha! Oh. Yeah. But, yeah, like, what if I had a gun? What if a spider has a. Okay, look, here's a gun. Oh, cow, I got one of my legs. Even with a gun, a tarantula isn't a threat. Oh, but yeah, let me try it with one of my weird mouth things, things. Do not use a gun with your mouth, giant tarantula. And that's what we're trying to say today, kids. Don't use a gun with your mouth. No one is trying to say that at all. That's right. And that's why it's so brave to come out against using guns with your mouths. No one is brave. You need to shut up. Kids, no one is... Kids, what am I saying? I'm not talking to kids. No one. No one use a gun with your mouth. I don't even think it needs to be said. No, you're right. It had to be said. Never had to be said. No one would ever conceive of it. How long have you had this store itself? This store? Well, I've been in Chester for 25 years. Okay. Yeah. Do you, do you, because I'm trying to figure out a little bit when people started buying tarantulas as pets. Do you remember the, like, when you got into this business, were they already pets? Do you remember? I remember there being tarantulas in store when I was a kid. And, uh, and, uh, I remember going to uh, importers before I opened the store and there'd be, uh, Boxes of uh, Mexican red knee tarantulas, which were the staple of the uh, of the of the pet industry, because they're a very docile, hardy tarantula. I love spiders. I think they're fascinating animals, and I've always loved them. But I am an outsider, you know. To to most people, most people are like spiders. What? No, I hate spiders. Yeah. I guess uh, the average person, when they think of someone who would like to have a bug as a pet, they think a child because a lot of adults in our society are sort of conditioned to fear bugs or have a distaste for them. Uh, we tend to live in our little bubbles. You know, we spend a lot of time indoors. Um, we're in our home, then we're in our car, then we're in our job. Do you know anything about like how this got started as a, you know, as a, as a, as a pet hobby, which is I guess the focus of the movie? I don't know how it gets started. Um, I know my, my father had a uh, Mexican red knee um, in the 70s. Well, you know what? I've, I've always grown up with exotic pets. Snakes. Um, I've had chinchillas. I've had sugar gliders. Pretty much every type of lizard you can think of. Ferrets. I never had like the typical, like a hamster. Instead of getting a hamster, I got a ferret. So I've always known that people collect them as pets. I didn't have my first encounter with holding a trance at the pet store until I was probably like 21, 20 or 21. So about, uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago. You know, KenTheBugGuy.com and, and, and that brand is the one that people mention. You know, when you are the, the big, you're the big guy, you know. Um, yes. And, and that, is, that is an accomplishment in a field that, as far as I can tell, thrives off of home breeding and trading and, and things like that. What what is Absolutely. that? Absolutely. Like? Well as with anything, um, being being the largest in the in the business, there there are the perks and there are the drawbacks. Um, 
a, a lot of people will come to us and, and seem to think that we have a staff of 50 and and it's like we're not Walmart. <laughs> um, we're not that big, but um, but we do have a very small staff, um, which does make it rough because, I mean, we have quite a few orders every week and obviously the animal care is utmost important. Um, what I would say is one of the most frustrating things for me is that when we get a brand new species that has never been in the U.S., uh, let's say it's just been newly discovered out of Brazil, um, and I have the opportunity to get some, the care sheets don't exist. And so a lot of the responsibility being the largest is being able to provide information and the, the, the care requirements for these animals. Well, when there is no info out there, um, what I've gotten into the habit of doing is basically, where are you from? I'm going to t I'm going to figure out the climate of that area and try to make you as comfortable as possible because I, that's all I've got to go on. Are they good pets? Uh, well, yeah, they're different. I would consider them like a fuzzy pet, but it's more of a collector kind of thing. This is as good a time as any to ask the big the big question, which you let me know about. How many tarantulas do you have currently? Currently, I have just tarantulas, about 42 of them. 42? I mean, yeah. that, that is a staggering number. That's a staggering yeah. number. And, and it's funny, I have, and I, I look at each individual one every single night, um, you know, make sure they've got their, their water. For me, it's how I wind down after my day. Um, I, I own a gym. So I open it up at 4 in the morning. I'm here till like, 9 at night. That's how I wind down. I love looking at all the different tarantulas, and that's how I interact with them. Speaking of, of, of the, the time in the industry, we're, one of the big questions I've been trying to ask with this movie is when, when this started, when the, the hobby of keeping tarantulas started, because it, it seemingly does feel like a new thing, but the more I ask people, the more they, they, the timeline gets longer and longer. Do you have any idea as to when this sort of became, even in even just in America, raising um, tarantulas, when, when it became a, a popular thing or even a viable pet store option? Um, I would say mid seventies actually okay. um, is when is when the the fascination and people started to actually uh, explore keeping them as pets. Um, I believe really started to make hold in the seventies. Um, I've got a couple of buddies that are older than me. I've got a guy that's been doing this, you know, thirty years and, uh, and both breeding and keeping um, the the tarantulas and the hobby. Now, with when it comes to diversity, I would say probably mid eighties was when we started really getting some of the cool stuff in the United States. Um, like your Pocalotheria, your Indian ornamentals and, um, some of the other, I guess, higher, no, I don't want to say higher end, but, um, uh, more exotic. Thank you. Yeah. The more, more advanced <laughs> species, I guess, um, you know, rose hairs have always been around, but, uh, some of these other guys, uh, like I said, I've got, I have two species in stock right now that, that, they, they have not been in the United States very long, I want to say six months or so. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I mean, it, the, the selection only gets larger, it seems like. Um, and so when it comes to the captive board or the captive breeding of it, um, I would say definitely n probably the last 10 to 15 years. But yeah, the hobby has been around for forever, it seems like. <laughs> it, does, it does seem like that. So there are three main points we need to get through to figure out tarantulas. The first is the exploration of the West. The second is America's relationship to wild animals. And, and it'll also include squids. Hi, I'm Harold the Squid here, squid lobbyist. Have you considered squids as your favorite animal? Maybe you want to think squids are cute. Buy a squid as a pet. I'm the squid lobbyist. Let me tell you all about squids. Get now, out of here, Harold! Are, this movie isn't about squids! Well, you know what, it could be. It could not be at all! It might be, you don't know. I swear to crap, Harold. Get out of here. He'll be back. That's a funny bit. So, let's start in 1800. America is still fresh. And fresh America's here. Get you fresh America's. Oy vey. So, America is new and not even finished yet. What is about to happen is extremely important to the place of tarantulas in America. The Louisiana Purchase. Fresh Louisiana's here. Get your fresh Louisiana's here. Wait, Gavalt, this joke.
So yes, in 1803, the Louisiana Purchase puts tarantulas in American territory for the first time. Do they, do they have, are their lives here much different than they are in the wild? I think so. Um, most importantly, here they're not going to get eaten. So they, they don't have anything to really uh, fear. Um, nothing's going to eat them. Uh, nothing's going to attack them. The thing I hear a lot with pets like fish, um, certain types of reptiles that aren't as interactive, the thing I hear a lot is they'll talk about the way they react to feeding time as sort of a friendly interaction. Do, do you find that, is that true or is that just an, a, a pet care, you know, projecting, you know, the fish comes to the top of the water is a big one. They come to the top when I, when I want to feed it, you know. Do, do you see that as projecting? Do they interact in that way? Like fish coming up to the surface. Um, me personally, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's a, a friendly thing. I would say that they know that they're going to be fed mm -hmm. and they want food. Um, not that I would maybe tell that to a small child, but, uh, but why not? Why not tell it to a, I mean, the reality is it's not, it's not Harry Potter. It's not Pokemon. The spider yeah. isn't going to be their friend. Yeah. You know, why, why, why? That's the thing I'm curious about is why we make this a child thing, but then we all end up with this weird reality about spiders mm. that is either they're deadly or you're, you know, a, a, a weirdo who thinks it's going to be your friend. You know, what, what, why don't we tell kids they're not, they don't like you. They don't really know you're there. Well, Here, when, when kids ask, uh, is she friendly? I'll say, well, she's not dangerous. Um, it's not like my dog that's going to run up to you and, and want to, you know, want to be interactive with you and have you pet it. The, the spider doesn't, the kids will ask, oh, does the tarantula like when you pet it? Say, no, she doesn't like it. Uh, she tolerates it. You know, she's used to it. So um, our tarantulas aren't going to, defend themselves because they're used to being handled. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think that they actually enjoy it. You know, I don't think that there's that interaction. You put your hand in the, in the terrarium, the spider's not going to walk up to you. Mm -hmm. It's not going to, it doesn't want to be your friend. Um, so feeding these animals, I don't see as a, as a bonding interaction. Uh, you might feel good about yourself feeding it because you're, prolonging its life and giving it sustenance. Um, but the tarantula um, isn't always thankful of its master, if, if you want to put it that way. Yeah. That uh, most people have tarantulas, have a bunch of them. So they, uh, they, they take them out. Them, yeah, <laughs> yeah they, they keep, it's like their, their collection. I don't, I don't think they, they take them out and play with them so much but there is an aspect of that and some of the varieties are aggressive so they don't really they don't take to handling so but what you, what what you'll find you've probably found in making this is tarantulas quickly lead into scorpions which lead into like other arachnids i mean it's it's like a gateway animal so i also have now i have 10 scorpions as well especially in the northeast you're very you're probably not going to have a bad interaction with a spider in the wild yeah, I, I've been picking them up since I was three years old, and I've never had a bad experience. Uh, that's not to say that they don't bite. You know, if they're scared, it's a little animal, and if this big animal comes and grabs it too hard, yeah, it might have to protect itself. But if you are gentle with them, a lot of times they'll just walk right over you. Um, and they're not out to get us. They're minding their business and eating little insects. Uh, they're really... They're harmless, most of them. There's no deadly tarantula, is there? No, there has never been a recorded death by tarantula bite um, anywhere in the world. Now, all spiders are venomous, absolutely. Most of them want absolutely nothing to do with, with humans. So yes, you can set them up in an aquarium, watch them like a fish tank, and feed them once a week, and they're happy as clams. Um, but the fear factor is, is a big factor, um, I, I, I believe. Um, we get people, in fact, uh, we had a guy that actually used to breed vipers um, and very venomous snakes. 
He walked into our shop and saw the open container of hissing cockroaches and was out the door because he has this, you know, irrational fear of cockroaches. And so, you know, the logic there doesn't make sense to me, but everybody's got their thing. So I think that there is a, a definite fear factor and a misunderstanding. I think it's mostly a lot of the times when I educate um, people that are scared, um, I have gotten many, many, many scared people to actually hold a tarantula for the first time because they just they did they were ignorant and they didn't know. So I think the educational part about it is is important to spread the fact that these do they, they make amazing pets and they're so much fun to watch. They have urticating hairs on their the back of their abdomen, so they that's their defense is they'll turn around and they'll take their hind legs and they'll flick these hairs. And if you look uh, under magnification, you'll see hooks and barbs all over the hairs. Every, every fact I learn about them being as pets is, is so unbelievably convenient. It sounds like I, – I, and I, I'm not supposed to tip opinions as a journalist, but it sounds almost too good to be true. You think that they're venomous. I mean a question I would have for you is I was interested in seeing if I could get an allergy test for, a, for their venom. Seemingly it's not even available because it's such a low risk. Uh, well, there's that and the fact that the venom potency from tarantula to tarantula is so vast. Um, you really, they don't, I don't think they could actually pinpoint a, an allergy per se test that you could take. Um, now, there, there is another factor when it comes to some of the New World tarantulas. Mm -hmm. um, New, New World are basically the ones that come from here. Um, and, um, and Old World would be, you know, your African species. The New Worlds will flick urticating hairs. They have hairs on their ab. Well, they've got they're covered in hair, but they can they have the ability to kick hairs off of their abdomen, which if it gets onto your skin, some of them can cause not just itching. It feels like you have dipped your arms in fiberglass, okay. and and it's very very irritating. So it's one of their defense mechanisms. If something comes sniffing along, they flick their hairs. It gets in the nose, and they want nothing to do with it. Um, so a lot of these guys, the first line of defense isn't biting. Um, it's either running or flicking hairs and getting the heck out of Dodge. And so they're very irritating. So not even a bite. They wouldn't even bite. They'd want to keep their distance because to bite something, if they were to bite, you know, a big animal that's trying to eat them, they can get injured or eaten. So they stay at a safe distance and they flick these urticating hairs, these defensive hairs. And uh, if the animal is sniffing, it'll go into the sinus cavity into the lungs into the eyes um, they'll cry sneeze and cough and uh, the spider has a chance to escape so the only way they would bite you is if you actually grabbed it um, mm. and quite often it's a dry bite where they don't waste their venom on something they're not going to eat I mean, right i mean that right. is that is a little bit of a pulled punch i think of the 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 tarantula community is is that the or, that those hairs do if they get on you they get they get on you you know that that right. is that is going to hurt. I think that is something yeah. That... It's more irritating than anything, but yes. Um, and with the volume that we do, you know, we we take precautionary measures, which generally don't work. <laughs> um, I've tried everything from wearing pantyhose on my arms to rubber gloves to everything. It almost makes it worse than just to deal with it and then wash. <laughs> So wait, um, you're saying that a rubber glove won't? It's just all over the place that it's going to get some place on your body when they do it. Well, that and it seems to it seems to attract to sweat and moisture. So when you're sweating inside those rubber gloves, the minute you take those gloves off, the hairs are all in throughout the air. So you're 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 basically making a collection spot for them. <laughs> um, and like I said, like with the pantyhose, it almost sticks worse to the pantyhose than it would if I wasn't wearing them at all. Um, so, and so yeah, we've go ahead. So it's not it's not it's not necessarily you know. Harm, harmless to, to, to deal with them. At a certain point, that, that may happen to you. Right, right. Um, yeah, I mean, like I said, I deal with a different volume of, 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 of spiders. So, I mean, for someone that has their one or two, maybe even up to 20 tarantulas at their house, they are probably not going to deal with as much as we do here. Um, once again, I'm doing importing and I'm, I'm shipping, so I'm, I'm disturbing these animals in their, in their enclosures, bumping them on the butt, you know, and, and getting them to do something they didn't really probably want to do by going into a vial. Um, and so it serves me right to get a little flicked at, you know, it's one of those things. Um, but when you're doing 200 at a time, that's when it starts getting pretty rough for the human. Um. <laughs> the thing that will happen is a thing called manifest destiny. It will take about 50 years, but the events inside it 
will link America and the tarantula until the present day. So, spoilers, in the next 50 years, America will obtain the West, as we call it, and manifest destiny, although it sounds like a magic spell. What will... is it? What? Is it a magic spell? I just, I just said it was. It just said it wasn't. Texas, at the... Did you try it? No, uh, no. Some writer used it to describe expansion to the West as being inevitable, uh, and it's stuck. You didn't try. Janice, get my wand and the rabbit. All we have is a hare or a koala. That's fine. Manifest destiny. Well, now we know. Te Texas, which was Mexico at the time, becomes a part of the United States. And Mexico has a lot of tarantulas. Brontelagos. Oh, God, what? And it, and it just it circles back to, it's just all about knowledge. I mean, if you're always in every TV show or every movie, you're seeing tarantulas being negative and biting and this and that. But that's what you're going to associate with. You know, and I probably did, too, at a young age. So I, you know, picked up a book. When I got into them, there wasn't really internet. Picked up a book and started reading about them. You know, and then, you know, once you learn about them, and I, it, for me, it's hard not to, to understand how somebody couldn't like them, how, how you would look at the animal and say, oh, that's gross or that's creepy. You don't get that. Well, to be fair, I think they're beautiful. Some, some of them, they are very beautiful. And to be fair, I think most interactions with pets, uh, uh, with them as pets, is mostly just a, a husbandry. But I think that, you know, there are some of them that, you know, uh, the, any you, like you said, any handling of them will cause stress. They're, they're, they they can bite, but I think what people probably don't know is the flip side as well, which is that most rodents' instinct is to to bite you when you pick them up, and right. you know most rodents you're gonna have to get bitten by them for them to to trust you. Why don't why don't people remember? Do, do, I'm always quick to do that. I'll be honest with you, Tim. I'm always quick to. Uh, as soon as someone says something about my out of line pet, I always go, "Well, you know, cats are cat, two out of five people are allergic to cats, or, or whatever the the real stat is." I might have, but you know, most people are allergic to cats, even people that own them. Uh, you know, and and dogs require all this maintenance and neutering and 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 surgery, and they're they're expensive and they they smell, they they need a lot of space. You know, I'm always quick to criticize other people's pets, but but why do you think? Why, 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 why do people cast dispersions before thinking, you know, whether their pet is difficult? Well, 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 because I think most people's pets are mainstream. So whether their pet is difficult or not, it's mainstream. So it's, it's, it's accepted. You know, walking down the street with a dog is, is great, even though you just bought an $80, you know, bag of dog food that's only going to last a month, and you spend, you know, $1,000 to have your dog neutered. It's still great. It's, oh, you have a dog who wants to pet it. What's the dog's name? Versus, you know, pop a, a snake around your neck that really requires zero maintenance once you set it up other than feeding it. And it's, you know, it's now you're the guy standing out because you got a snake around your neck. So I think it's just because it's mainstream. It's accepted. So it's just, it is what it is. You know, and, and I, actually, I, I don't think people's, I don't think people kind of, shy away from tarantulas or exotic pets because they think they're higher maintenance. I think if they just, tarantulas in general, I think they just, they're dangerous. Um, you know, and I, I think most people believe that tarantulas can kill you. Yeah. I, I, I really believe that because that's the first question I get is, can it kill you? And then I, I'll i say this, Mike, it's funny. When I tell people, no, there's no tarantula on the planet that can kill you, most people I can tell don't believe that answer. I think they think I'm just saying it to justify it because I keep tarantulas. It, it's a funny reaction. You can tell there's some people that are like, oh, I didn't know that. That's, that's interesting to know. And there's some people that completely dismiss it, and they're just going to keep believing that tarantulas can kill humans. But it's kind of funny the way people take knowledge. But 
So, before America actually takes a part of Mexico, what do we know about tarantulas? Well, it's used as a pejorative, an insult, sort of uh, to make fun of other politicians, a dirtbag, a sleazy kind of person, a slime bag. Speaking of slime bags, what about squids at the time, you know? Hey, I'm Harold, squid lobbyist. I was... <laughs> The other thing that America and the world knows about tarantulas is the dance of tarantula. We're not doing a dance. Go away. It may seem cursory that they share the same name, but you're going to see that this dance and the actual facts of science get mixed up for a really long time. I said go away. We're not doing a dance. So a few years ago, I made a movie about the history of hamsters, and there was one hanging chad I could never solve. I couldn't prove it, but there were all these import-export laws banning hamsters. At the time, hamsters were coming from China. So, I wanted to... Um, I thought the laws were racist. Don't Whoa. say that, Cody. Don't do that. Don't hey, say that. Beep, come that's on. not funny. You can't just throw words around like oh, tarantulas that. Tarantulas aren't a race. Come on, you, you can't say that kind of stuff. Look, look, look. I know that's a big word, and I couldn't prove that. But, legitimately here... Not liking tarantulas, and I think I can prove this. I think that not liking tarantulas is racist. On, I don't want to hear you. Come on. Hey. Yeah, no, that's a little bit That's out of bounds, Mike. No, seriously, I think I can prove it. I'm not saying tarantulas are a race. So let's get a few more facts straight before we move forward with the history here. Timeline wise, right now we are at the 1820s ish. Here's what we are missing and working our way towards. In 1848, the U.S. takes Texas outright from Mexico, along with the tarantulas. And even though there are a lot of factors, let's call the gold rush in 49 um, and California entering the U.S. as a state, the completion and end of Manifest Destiny. Animal-wise, we have no cure for rabies until 1885. Plus, anti-venom won't be perfected until 1896. That's what we need to get to. Anti-venom. Do you sell a lot of tarantulas? We sell a few. I wouldn't say a lot. <laughs> uh, How often does a tarantula stay here as opposed to, like, another pet? Oh, it depends on, on how exotic they are and, uh, and uh, how expensive they are. Sometimes, like a rarer tarantula might be here for a year or more before we sell it. Sometimes we've got spiderlings that were the size of a fingernail, and it, they're that big before we sell them, so. It is, it but, is odd that, that the, the tarantula and the world, I mean, I think we think more about someone like you or, or even someone like I who has you know a different pet collection that you think about that person when it comes to tarantula when in reality a ferret is a huge expense comparatively even though you know once we start to get off the spectrum even cat or dog or hamster you know the initial cost of a tarantula is pretty high but other than that they do seem to be easier and which is sort of a bad word but easier more docile more of a a forgiving pet to to take care of than say a cat or a dog which we don't bat an eye at you know an eye at at all oh oh yeah i mean i'll i would let you know uh my my client's kids hold one of my tarantulas way before i would give them a uh, a hamster because all hamsters i mean they're just they're, they're they're just so misunderstood, and they're just, they are, they're just so docile. Um, and you know what? And if you get them at slings, they cost nothing. I mean, a P. regalis, which as an adult it is, uh, I mean, a, an adult female is probably a four hundred dollar tarantula. You get it as a sling for like three dollars. So I mean, that that's the kind of cool thing is if you want to put the time in to raise it up, which is fun to do, you can have a four hundred dollar animal. For the cost of thirty dollars, you know, and it, and it, that's the other thing that I think is pretty cool about them. That's that's I guess one of the weird. I've heard people almost call tarantulas not pets; they'll call them collections sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an interesting thing. This idea of a pet that you can't cuddle. Yeah, it's, it's a strange paradigm. Yeah, well, um, people collect different things. Some people collect baseball cards. Some people collect. Uh, rocks and minerals and uh, some people collect 
living organisms. So the spider, some depending on your perception, you can look at it as a pet because you're interacting with it when you're feeding it, you know. And there's that you know pet and owner relationship, um, but they're not going to establish an emotional connection with you. Um, it's it's very different from having a dog or a cat. So you can look at it from the collector's standpoint, and it's um, it's an interesting animal to have. Are you always going to pet stores? Like likely not is what I is what I'm hearing is that there is a, a community of people uh, trading and, and and breeders that mostly you're not going through big name pet stores who are going to charge you huge amounts because they're they're fully grown uh, tarantulas at that point usually right. Oh, right. I've, I've actually never bought a tarantula from, from a big box store, ever. Simply because that's not what the community does, or it, just because of cost? Uh, no, not because of cost at all. Um, it, it, in the tarantula community, or even really just the red hot community, and, you know, and I'm not going to name names, but the big box stores, they don't have the knowledge, and I think it's because they don't have the money to pay the staff to get people with knowledge, they have no idea how to care for their animals. So when you see, especially something like tarantulas, because they, they you know, they may have one or two uh, specimens a year. You know, they don't know what they're doing. So when you see the conditions that they're in, I mean, they're just terrible. You'd be buying an animal that, if you're lucky, it might stay alive for a month. Uh, you know, you almost want to buy them to try to save them, but you realize that's a loss because you can't buy every sick animal you see. But no, I mean, I, I don't know how many people you'll be talking with. I can probably guarantee you anyone that's a serious collector, not even at my level, but, um, you know, but if they have 10 or more, I would say they, they bought maybe one, if any, from a big box store. Do any locally, or, or, or what's the what's any closer breeders? Uh, there is there is a, a local guy that raises them, but uh, I have yet to actually get any spiderlings from him. Okay. So. <laughs> Where, where's what's your primary source for them? Uh, one of the uh, uh, importers I deal with down okay. in uh, Miami. Um, let's let's circle back again to what. It, so let's say you breed. Um, a, a spiderling, and I and I order it. What's the okay. what's the process like from it it being born to ending up at my doorstep? Okay, um, the process for um, a captive born uh, spiderling to then reach the customer, we um, there are a couple of molting processes that go on before the spiderling can even eat. Uh, we make sure that the spider can and will eat and is healthy. So then when the customer orders it, we, um, we package it up. We have vials that we pad with um, either paper towel and um, toilet paper. Where, where are the ones you breed? Are, are they in the, the factory? How far does it have to travel? You know what I mean? To get to a mailing center or something like that. Oh, um, no, I'm, I'm actually right now while talking to you, I'm surrounded by approximately 5,000 tarantulas. Um, they are in, depending on the size, the babies, we have them in um, what we call a 40 dram vial. It's basically a three inch by two inch uh, cylindrical vial with a lid. Um, and then if they are larger, they would then live in uh, either a, a, a larger deli or a um, like a, what am I trying to say, like a Tupperware kind of container. Um, and from there they would go, uh, you know, we'd put dirt in there for them. Um, and then from there, I would then coax them out of that and into the packing material. Um, and then they are sent via FedEx, uh, generally priority. Um, the least amount of time in transit as possible is always best. And then the customer will then open up and um, unpack their spiders into their new enclosures. Is there anything that a vet can do for an arthropod in a, in a situ I don't I don't know enough about it. You know, has there ever been a scenario? No, not really. I mean, really, the only thing that happens to them is they, they get dehydrated, mm -hmm. right? And then you make you can make something what's called an ITU, which, you, which I've done before. I've done this when I thought a tarantula was dehydrated. If when it's going into a molt, when it sheds its skin, typically they stop eating. 
and if it has a longer molt and it doesn't eat long enough, I feel like I'm gonna get dehydrated. You simply you just take like a plastic deli cup, you put you know a few very small holes, just enough for air to pass through, and you get like a nice, really wet paper towel where you put it in there, a big water dish. You let the transfer sit in there for about two days. Um, you know, and you re moisten the towel, and then you put it back in a nice warm environment, um, and then that 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 springs them right back to life. But other than you know, if you leave the window open and it gets 20 degrees, that's going to kill a transfer. Nothing really happens to them. I mean, there's a reason they've been on the planet for millions of years. It's not that much defenses because they're. I mean, they're just rock solid. Yeah, it does. It does. It does. I mean, it's it's trying to count the reasons not to do it, not to make it a more common pet, are harder and harder as I make the movie. You know, uh, the the, oh, the yeah. ten to twenty years thing I didn't know about until I started it. No cause of death ever. Um, you know, and now the idea that, as far as I can tell right now, but until I do some research, there is nothing a veterinary visit could do for a sick arthropod. It, it seemingly is a a cheap, well cared for pet that can live a long time. I mean, I, I I don't see too many. You know, I would love it if if it turned out that everybody was right. You know, you know what I mean. It would be it would be relieving to me if everyone wasn't uneducated about this and that the movie was unnecessary and that no, actually they'll kill you and they're very expensive. But it seemingly it's the complete opposite of what people think. Is there any way, because I'm trying to figure out the origin of it, is there any way I could talk to one of them? Like, uh, do you think there's any that would be open to... Yeah, I don't, uh, I don't know if there's anybody I could really recommend for you. Mm -hmm. I mean, you might want to try Ken the Bug Guy out in Arizona. Yeah. And, uh, you, so, and so... It, so Ken the Bug Guy itself does not breed? Uh, yes, we do. Okay. I actually do quite a bit of breeding here within the shop as well. Um, so there is, there is, like I said, there's that, there's that aspect of it. And basically that would involve, um, obviously breeding the tarantulas. Uh, there are certain species where we will pull the egg sac from mom. Um, but most of them, I allow mom to do her thing because they make pretty darn fantastic parents. Um, what about the men and, while we're on breeding for a second, you know, when, sure. the, when the process was described to me, uh, th this idea of they, they sort of like make almost an injection right could, could mm -hmm. you explain Absolutely. that a little bit of course um basically when so you have a, you have a male tarantula um when it what we call the ultimate molt um or its final molt it um it basically develops the 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 man parts if you will um and is now you can, able you can, to you know it's 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 geared towards tweens but Please feel free to use, you know, the anatomically correct uh, uh, terms. It, does it develop? Does it have gonads its whole life, or, or does? You Absolutely know? not. No, and um, they actually don't develop technically the gonads, but they do. They do develop a um, an organ on the, uh, the the tibial legs of their body, um, which is basically the front two legs, um, and uh, and it's it's a mechanism that allows them to build a sperm web. Um, they basically build a web. They they eject the sperm from their from their abdomen, and then they take those um, those pedipalps and they basically charge and shove a bunch of sperm into the uh, into the sac. And that way, when they meet the female, they have that sperm available to then insert in her epigastric furrow. Um, the females can store sperm for an incredible amount of time. Um, I've seen it up to a year. And uh, when she is ready and when the conditions are optimal, she will lay an egg sac and then wrap it in uh, webbing, which may basically looks like a golf ball. And she holds it and rotates it and basically cares for it until 
the babies emerge. I, I get all of mine from just people I've met um, on Craigslist. You know, it, it's sort of a tight-knit community. You kind of find some people you know. Uh, because my business, I don't have time to go to the reptile shows. So I actually have a friend that goes for me. Um, he's in some translates, and he gets what, what I might need and what he needs, and we trade. Um, or I love, I love mom and pop pet stores. Um, you know, the ones that they know what they're doing, the animals are just clean, the cages are pristine. Those stores I buy from. And I, I've, I've bought quite a few from a couple of um, mom and pop pet stores uh, locally. Where, where do you guys get your, your spiders? You don't breed here, so you just replace them as they go? Uh, well, they live a long time. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these, the males will live 10 to 12 years, um, and the females can live over 30 years. So, so it's not a huge issue all the time? Yeah, so we, we have them for quite a long time, mm -hmm. um, but we do trade with other collectors and breeders um, we breed millipedes and other things here, so oh, cool. um, we can trade millipedes that other people can't get um, for scorpions or tarantulas. And so that's you're allowed to do that? You're allowed to, like, is, can it just be a collector off the street? Do you need a license to do that? or? or... Um, well, as long, it depends. If they're, if they're on the sightings list, then you would want documentation in Mexico or Costa Rica, they're not allowed to export them without documentation. Mm -hmm. um, so you wouldn't, if you have them here, if you know it's from a captive breeder, then you're okay. But they're, you know, you don't know exactly where it's coming from. So you would want some documentation. So do you find that frustrating if, you know, all of a sudden you, you have this, this animal that creates this sperm and, and the men are, you know, can often die in the process of doing this, and then you're waiting a year to get spiderlings? Um, I mean, it, it does take quite a bit of patience. Um, one of the common misnomers is that the males always die. Um, nine times out of ten, when we captive breed, the males actually do get away. Um, a lot of the times, like in the wild, what, what happens to the boy is that he's actually going into her burrow, which is danger zone. Um, they, they get it on, and yes, her first reaction when he unhooks her is to pounce. If he has enough room to get away, a lot of the times the boys will make it to, to see another date. Um, I actually have a couple of males that I've been working with, gosh, um, almost six months now, and they've had multiple dates. Now, in, in captivity, I do use uh, very high-tech equipment like a spatula and a stick <laughs> um, to, uh, to basically, when, when he does unhook, I will put the stick right between her fangs. So basically, she's running into something versus being able to immediately pounce on him. Um, I also allow them a lot of room. And, um, and yeah, basically the, the males almost always get away. Now, sometimes she's a little quicker than me and, uh, and that is, that is a bummer, but, but it's, that it is what it is. Do you, do you, do you have plans for, for expanding or, or expecting any of them to pass soon? Um, no, um, I only buy females, uh, you know, because they live much, much longer, um, I would say my oldest tarantula right now is probably only 14 or 15 years old. So even she has probably another 10 years to live. Um, I'm constantly buying more. I actually bought four more scorpions last night. Um, so, yeah, no, my collection will, will continue to grow. The issue in America for a while is import and export taxes or tariffs. I'm not saying tariff because I'm not 200 years old. It's a tax. So, working on the coasts is dead. Uh, hair for sale, bits of my personal hair for sale, hair for sale, hair for sale. No! No, Ted, I'm not buying that! Okay. Yeah, business is, uh, bad everywhere. So, people want to expand. As we start to expand, two groups start to get attacked and attacked hard. First are the Native Americans. The Indian Removal Act treats Native Americans like they are in the way. And next up is Mexico. America starts moving west. No one has said Manifest Destiny yet, but it is what's happening in America. And it starts in going towards Texas. 
remember, Texas is new. A lot of writers are describing it as this magical wilderness, this exotic land that Americans get to explore. Uh, and even then, tarantulas are sort of passe. They already know about them. There's a lot of hype about this animal, the jigger, which people who live in the region know is a very uninteresting animal. Into the 1830s, a guy named Boisson shows up. He's either an idiot or, or a scam artist, but he's treating rabies with baths. And he starts to talk about how tarantulas and this dance of the tarantulas might be associated with uh, rabies. Now, the very real shakes and shivers and spasms that come from rabies are now being mixed in with this fictional thing of when you get bit by a tarantula, it makes you dance. The word venom is thrown around a lot, but remember, we don't understand venom at the time. It's going to be another 60 or so years until we understand venom. Even still, as science is struggling to keep up with what tarantulas do, as people start to move west, the main thing that's happening is tarantulas are being reported as deadly. There's also a pretty decent racehorse in the 1840s named Tarantula, so I'm going to ride him for the rest of this segment, or a fictional version of him. So in 1845, the Mexican-American War starts as an attempt to annex... Annex is another old people word that I refuse to say. In an attempt to take or conquer Texas from Mexico. As the men, who have never seen any of this wildlife, join the ranks to fight the Mexican-American War, there are a lot of reports of tarantulas. There are two issues here. Remember, tarantulas don't really come out that much, so these frequent accounts of them being seen so much seems unlikely. But these armies are essentially trailblazing and colonizing new lands, so it is possible that they disturbed some of them. But they are all seeing them for the first time. They aren't really tarantula experts, so these positive identifications from soldiers seem dubious. But then a quote comes up that explains a lot of it. In an article about tarantula snakes and the infestation of them on the front lines of the war in Texas, someone says, Florida may be the land of promise, but Texas is the land of varmints. Racist. Racist, racist, yeah, racist, 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 racist. I mean, there it is, right there. America's attitude towards race connected with tarantulas. Florida, which was recently cruelly and abruptly removed of its native population by Andrew Jackson. Texas, which has to be taken from the Mexicans. And tarantulas, an animal which has killed no one and probably no one has seen that much. They are all the same to the American military. Varmints. Pests. If you hate tarantulas, you're a racist. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you are. I guess you are. Yeah, you are. Hey, no one said that, but the next 50 years don't get much better. And I'm going to show that maybe hating tarantulas doesn't make you a racist, but maybe we hate tarantulas because of racism. But in theory, none of them are neutered, right? You can't neuter or spay a, a, a tarantula. Right. So in theory, I mean, can I, can anyone just breed once they get them legally? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's risky business. Tarantulas are solitary animals. Mm -hmm. So breeding them, um, there's always a risk with the male and female. You don't know if they're going to get along. Um, Got it. <laughs> so yeah, they, the females can be really defensive or um, aggressive. Um, you know, mechanically, the bite can hurt, but that's, that's what stops. They can't do anything to you. No, um, no so for me, it, death. it's just knowledge. No, none. Yeah. I mean, none. I, I think the worst thing that happens is, you know, and I don't even think you have to, but people go to the hospital uh, for cramping, and they might get some muscle relaxers. And, you know, and those are only the um, the old world tarantulas that can cause any damage like that. <laughs> so I, I guess while we're on the, this topic at the moment, um, you know, for me, I, I see in reptiles and in fish, you know, they, they go out, there's no way to, to neuter or spay them. You know, how, how often are you guys seeing the facilities of, of other breeders? You know, um, how often are you worried about just people breeding on their own? Oh, we, we promote it. Um, we, we always want people, I mean, we actually sell breeding pairs to some hobbyists because, um, because they either want to try their hand or they have, um, already had a lot of experience. Anytime we can get captive born stuff and within the hobby, that is always a good thing. Um, and for me being one of the largest, um, I do have the, the, I don't know what word I'm looking for here, but it's it's nice because a lot of people will come to us 
and say, hey, I produce these curly hairs. I don't want 200 spiders. Can I sell them to you? You know, and they'll they'll either trade them to us or 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 sell them outright. Um, and so we get a lot of opportunities to actually buy those sacks from people. So that's that's always nice. The the lack, you know, one element that we're doing with this is that uh, bugs and spiders and things like that seem to be even from the the mainstream of of knowledge and teaching kids is that kids seem to be very interested in bugs and and you know, dinosaurs and things like that. But yet, as we come to be adults, those are usually the two most misunderstood topics in biology is, is, is dinosaurs and bugs. Why, why are all kids interested in spiders and stuff, but then they're growing up to think tarantulas are, are, are deadly? You know what? It's, it's, probably, it's probably like, you know, when you're a little kid, you like to play in the backyard, digging in the mud, play with the creepy crawlers. You know, probably the first animal encounter exotic right if you will animal encounter you has as uh, you have as a kid it's probably picking up like an earthworm right you see a worm in the grass or in the dirt you got to pick it up and play with it uh you know so that's probably like the first little encounter and then you realize like bugs are cool i think as kids bugs are cool they're fun but then because you sort of don't know any different and i don't want to say you don't know any better but you sort of don't know any better you're you're you haven't been taught through you know, mainstream media or parents or whatever teachers that they're not doing it intentionally. That it's the right thing to teach that you know bugs are dangerous or bugs are gross or bugs are dirty. You know, as a little kid, it's just you know you're interested in everything. You know, you see some creepy crawly moving around on the ground, you want to pick it up. It, you know, that's your instinct is to pick it up. Then, as you get older, it's it's a taught response that oh well, wait a minute that that's dangerous or that's dirty or that's gross. You know, I think I think you're taught that. Um, because we don't spend a lot of time outdoors. We're not in touch with nature. We spend most of our lives in these little bubbles, especially as we get older. Mm -hmm. um, kids spend a lot of time playing in the grass and dirt, in the woods. Uh, but as you get older, there's less and less free time. And so, um, you know, we're used to our little, our little boxes. And when things get into your little private space um you don't like them so yeah. that's why people don't like roaches house centipedes spiders ants um because mice they yeah they're Things invading our space yeah. it's, um, i mean it's instinctual in some way you're supposed to like they would probably bite you for coming in their den hmm. you would do the same right it's it, but it's, it's a that's a sophisticated thing that i don't know if a kid you know, gets. It's just I want I want people to be into this. Yeah. I want like adults and everyone to be you know all about it. Yeah, now, a lot of kids just they don't have that yet. They 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 don't look at the world in that way yet. Mm -hmm. um, they're still just soaking it all in and they're absorbing all of this information and haven't formulated a an opinion like this should stay on that side of the fence. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, you have to understand that Louis Pasteur is going to come along and fix this entire scenario. Once his work comes out, it's him that cures rabies in 1885 and a colleague at his lab that figures out anti-venom. But from 1849 at the end of the war through and up until 1896, there are a lot of bad articles with bad science published on the tarantulas. Here's one to make your hair crawl. In 1887, one man in an article recommends and gives a success story of wrapping Turkey entrails, turkey entrails, by the way, are like guts and stomach parts, uh, recommends uh, wrapping turkey entrails around tarantula bites. But, of course, being <laughs> logical, the man recommends warm meat for the bite of a reptile. We go live now in the field to Karen at the grave of Louis Pasteur. Karen? Hi, Mike. I'm here at the grave of Louis Pasteur, where he's spinning in his grave like a crazy person. Back to you, Mike. So, there's not only that gross science, but until rabies is cured, tarantulas and rabies are incredibly tightly linked. The public at the time certainly believes that there's a link between the two. Now, that's, that's crazy to me, this idea of uh, someone else mentioned a new species uh, and, then, and then you just, they, they, they become pets right away. Is there, is there no, you know, uh, concern that, you know, you remove the, the animal or, or it seems as though 
there's almost no environmental repercussion to removing them from from their environment because they they're they're predators and they seem to be doing fine. You know, the idea of finding a new species and then it becoming so quickly available for, to collectors that that's that's a uh, that's amazing to me. Well, and it's it's that's actually interesting you bring that up. Um, there, uh, okay. So the rose hair tarantula we've been talking about, which is one of the easiest, most popular pets uh, when it comes to tarantulas. Oddly enough, last year Chile, which is where they're from, um, shut down all export of that genus. They are considered a Gramostola rosea. Um, any Gramostolas now cannot be exported out of Chile. They have shut it down for that conservation reason. Um, they were finding that they were being overcollected, which actually was having an environmental impact. Um, same with Tanzania and the emperor scorpion. Emperor scorpions used to be 15 bucks a pop. I cannot get my hands on one now for less than $150. Uh, but then they, uh, they cut off the uh, exports of the wild ones from Mexico, I think sometime in the 1990s, but I'm not sure. So you have to buy uh, captive raised ones now. So, so how, do you, how do you buy them here? Uh, you know, some from, uh, breeders, uh, mm -hmm. some from, uh, importers. I'm always open to, mm -hmm. you know, a good supplier. And then the other element what? to it, same side of the same coin is, you know, I have, I have stranger pets. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know that I would want to call any pet strange, but in terms of interactions right. with other people, you know, how do you go about when, when you say to someone, not only do I have a, a tarantula, but I have, you know, 42. To someone like me, I go, that is beautiful. But I think for most people, they're, you know, uh, they're going to, you know, how do you, how do you explain that to someone who goes, oh, I'm afraid of tarantulas or I'm afraid of spiders or, oh, that's such a weird thing. How do you react to that? Well, it, it's funny. Um, at my age now, I'm, I'm 36, so. I've kind of, I've, I've got my set group of, like, friends and people that I know and my clients. So everybody just knows this about me because I've always had odd animals, right? So it, it's nothing really new to anybody. If I were to meet somebody for the first time, and it, it happens rarely now, like, I'll get a new client and we talk and, I you know, I let them know what I have. Uh, it's, I think it's all in the way you explain it. Uh, their first the initial reaction is always, like, you know, uh, can it kill you? That's that's probably the first question I get almost immediately is, well, can it kill you, or isn't it poisonous? You know, and then you have to explain the difference between poison and venom. But, um, you know, it, I always explain to you how, how docile they are, and no, there's no tarantula on the planet that can kill you. Uh, you know, they don't want to use their venom. They want to use their venom only to eat. You know, it, I think it's just, how you explain it, and then usually I'll bring one in. If it's a new client, I'll bring one in so they can see it in person. And I think once you see one and you see how you know, calmly they move and they're not rearing back to bite you, people get a, a you know a newfound appreciation for them. What's the what's the what's the cause there that there's not much known about their sicknesses? Um, I think it's because they are so diverse, um, and and once again they are not a it's probably not very profitable for, let's say, a veterinary clinic to have a tarantula specialist <laughs> um, because there aren't a lot of people bringing their tarantulas in. Um, so, I mean, I would probably say supply and demand would be the biggest factor when it comes to not having the availability of a vet everywhere. I think one problem with exotics in this way is that the most passionate of us come off as the, you know, we damn ourselves by being passionate about the animal so you know the person that doesn't get that a scorpion you know can be cared for and 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 live pretty much the same life indoors as it does outdoors except it's not going to get hunted and that they're beautiful and that you're, you're you're passionate about giving it a good home they see that accomplishment as that that leans them more away towards them that you pick it up and that you want it to be friendly towards them i think that's that's an element that i'm trying to crack with this as well is that for for when I hear he's successfully taking care of forty two animals and they, they're healthy and they're, they're they're well kept, that's a great thing. And then the person that doesn't get it goes, "Oh, he's got forty two of them. Oh, oh, oh my goodness, that's crazy." Right. Well, yeah. I mean, and, and yeah, and, and I can get that, but it's 
it, like I said, it goes back to, well, uh, 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 so here, take somebody that has a dog, right? The most common dog on the planet right now, I think, is, is, a, uh, is a lab, right? A lab is about 70 pounds, right? They stand about three feet high, two, two and a half feet high. They're about four feet long, right? A ton of people have those in little apartments in the city, right? So that lab that is now living in basically a cage, right, the cage being the apartment, is probably taking up, uh, in a small apartment, probably taking up one one-hundredth of the apartment, right, its living space. My 42 tarantulas in my four-bedroom home are taking up maybe one one-thousandth of the space. They have way more space to move around than what your typical dog would be in a typical size home. You know what I mean? Plus the fact when most people go to work, they crate train dogs. They've convinced themselves that dogs like to be locked up in a small cage during the day. Uh, you know, so to me, I think that's weird. I sort of think that's cruel. Um, and, and in my experience, I used to have a lot of ball pythons. I don't, I don't deal with them anymore. But when I used to put them in big elaborate cages, they wouldn't eat. They wouldn't shed properly. Then when I would put it in smaller, tight, confined spaces, a smaller cage, they went back to eating great. They were shedding great. I mean, they literally crave, it's so the tarantulas, a tight, confined space. Tarantulas crave it mostly because they, you know, they don't have great eyesight. So they want to know what their surroundings are. You put a tarantula in a new cage, for the first two days, it almost nonstop moves around the cage. It literally knows every little aspect of that cage, and then it's happy. Then it'll, it'll make its little burrow or make its little web, depending on what kind of species, and then it's happy. You, re, you rehouse it, right? Say it grows too big, you put it in a new cage, it does the same thing. It has to get the lay of the land. Once it knows every little aspect, it gets happy. I always point out to people that most dogs are about the size of a goat and that it would be very strange if they kept a goat in their house. Uh, <laughs> right, yeah. They would, they would realize the size problem once they saw a goat in there. But we see for the first time the mention of these animals as pets. Yes, as far as I can tell, drum roll please, Jack Turner is the first recorded instance of a person having not just a pet tarantula, but insects as well. Turner was interviewed in a human interest story about his collection and how to best take care of tarantulas. <laughs> to be uh, honest, Turner says some things about tarantulas that aren't entirely accurate. He talks a great deal about bug and spider suicide, which I, I don't know. But either way, at least for the span of that afternoon in which the article was written, Jack Turner had pets, bugs, as tarantulas. Or at least someone was conceiving the idea that they could be pets. Okay, wow. And speaking of fights, there are two stories that come up all the time in newspapers, and I mean all the time. The first is the tarantula hawk. Okay, what's a tarantula hawk? A tarantula hawk is a wasp. It flies over, it lands on the back of a tarantula. A tarantula can't reach its back, really. Uh, lays eggs in the tarantula's back. That's it, okay? Look at me. From 1852 until 1916, not a month goes by that this same story, and I, and I mean the same story, sometimes it's just plagiarized or even cited from another newspaper, but not a month goes by, except for the years in the Civil War, that that story isn't published in some newspaper in those 70 years. 70 years of not a month going by without that article being published about the tarantula hawk. It is maddening. It takes so much for people to believe anything about tarantulas being not deadly, but this weird wasp fact, which is, I mean, it's true, it does happen, stays solid for close to a century. Which brings me to my second unbearable story. Remember when I said trade with South America is important? Well, in 1891, this story starts to crop up. Quote, tarantulas found in bananas. This story of finding a tarantula in bananas gets published oh so much. Some storekeeper gets a bunch of bananas or fruits and they bravely fight off or else terrify some customers with the encounter. Now while this may or may not happen all the time it is reported, the story is printed constantly. Quite frankly, mostly with no specifics. I do not doubt it could have happened and it probably did. The countries of origin make sense where they're getting the fruit. Um, 
it isn't implausible, but the story gets published so much that it actually becomes a cliché. Authors even begin to describe towns as, quote, a place where you might get a tarantula in a banana. Giving a nasty person a bunch of bananas with a tarantula in it is a well-known and accepted phrase, or at least well-known enough that you could say it and people wouldn't be confused. It, too, becomes a frequent, if not overprinted, story. Let me say, I have read this story over and over again. I poured through newspapers trying to avoid it. But once again, you guessed it. The colorful sign makes me less sad, but there is an instance in which, again, there is proof of racism. Every time this story comes up, a brave shop owner, that's important, it's an owner of a shop, uh, fights off the beast, saves a woman's life, whatever it may be. Uh, sometimes the battles last for hours in the stories, and again, it is likely fictional most of the time. But the only, and I mean only time, someone is described as being too scared to handle the spider is in an article titled, quote, Monster Tarantula Frightens Negro. In 1921, by the way, the story was so heavily a cliche by then, the story is written very differently about a bumbling black employee who messes everything up because he finds a spider in fruit he has to move at work. It is anyone's guess as to why someone would write such a disgusting article, and probably guessing should be left to the leaders of racial relations, but for whatever reason, fear of tarantulas and fear of non-white races are heavily linked in America's past. So then, things start to move really quickly. Through the 1900s, the movie industry booms, and we see a tarantula make its first appearance in a movie, The Mystery of the Laughing Death, in 1914. And again, despite it being on a film set, the animal is described as deadly. Then the world is at war between World War I and II and the Depression. Pets become more about what is around than anything. However, after the war, electricity and technology is also launched forward, making things like heating lamps and other things necessary to care for exotic pets which normally wouldn't live in your environment become easier to make, afford, and obtain when the 1950s come around. As far as I can tell, between advertisements and the TV records, Murray Zarette is the first big influence on tarantulas becoming a pet in 1965. Zarette had a place in Coney Island, or at least ran it and put his name on it, uh, with all sorts of exotic pets, including tarantulas. Zarette went on to be an animal provider for a lot of different TV shows, including being a regular on a TV show called Birthday House, and was even on Johnny Carson, uh, although those appearances on Carson were lost because of uh, a fire that has lost a lot of the TV record during that time period. Then after that, the big names start to show up. The names you and I know from pets and the names of people we've even interviewed, uh, they start to crop up. And that's it. That's history. The tarantula becomes a part of who we are and, and, and America itself. The pet industry explodes. And any animal can be anywhere. And I have a nine-month-old son, and I will, as he gets older, you know, he will definitely have a healthy respect for animals. And I would hope that he would continue, um, you know, into would, would start into this hobby as well. And then we can kind of do it together. Or he flips the other way, the opposite of you as a kid, and he's like, ah, oh, geez, I just want to have conventional, I'm going to get, like, a dog and a, you know, a hamster. <laughs> he could be... You know what, all, all, my, all my friends say that, they're like, you're pushing them, you know, all of his little stuffed animals are like little spiders, uh, he's got little scorpion toys. They're like, you're pushing him too far in one direction, he's going to rebel, all he's going to want is a cat, because I, I almost despise cats, I can't stand cats. You know, there's a... It's sort of a weird thing with pets, and I guess this is the last thing that we'll talk about, but, you know, there's this weird thing where we, we seemingly don't want to educate people, and there's, there's, there's not a lot in place, and it would seem as though when pets are either A, expensive, or B, it's not, I'm not going to say dangerous, because I think that's an unfair word, every, almost every animal is a, is a danger, um, but when there is a risk involved, seemingly those people get educated because of necessity, either from not wanting to lose money or from right. or from the fact that they don't want to get hurt. 
you know. Correct. How do how, what what as as someone who's been working in this field for at such a high volume for so long, what do you think we can do to 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 bring this type of education to where I talk to people who own exotics and they're almost as knowledgeable as veterinarians in the field because they just get to know their animal. You know, what can right. you do to bring this level of education to other people? Um, I would say the first thing to bring that to um, to the attention would just be exposure. Uh, when uh, when we go to shows, I get you know I answer the same question over and over again, and that's just fine because it's it's different people wanting to know. And so as long as as long as we keep the 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 proper treatment and the responsible handling and keeping of these animals in the public eye, I guess if you will. Um, and continue to educate along the way, especially with the kids. The, you know, kids are our future, as they say, and, and getting them interested in the sciences and the conservation of some of these animals. Um, that would be another big one. You know, if all of these animals get wiped out, there's not going to be anything to educate for. So, I mean, the conservation is, is, is key as well. But, um, you know, basically just keeping it in the keeping the good stories in the, the media as well as the, as the bad ones. You know, like I said, we, we've talked about Hollywood and giving it a bad rap. If, if I can come out with three videos that counteract the scary factor, then, you know, maybe that'll help somebody. Um, once again, knowledge is power, and it's amazing what a little education does for someone that is absolutely frightened will do for their fear. Um, it never ceases to amaze me. <laughs> <laughs> you have well, to I mean, you don't know. people... People, I mean, come in here and, um, like I said, I've been doing this 10 years. I've done a whole ton of reading. Um, and, you know, I'm considered an expert. Well, I'll tell you what, I have just scratched the surface, man. Um, there, <laughs> there is so much that I don't know about, you know, other bugs that I haven't read, like Katie did. So I couldn't tell you a darn thing about a Katie did other than it looks like a cricket. You know, right. Because I haven't explored that. Um, I am... You know, I'm better, way better with the tarantulas, but I still, there's still stuff I don't know. Um, there's a lot to learn. 